Well, hi, everybody. I'm Roger Marshall, uh, now the junior senator from the great state of Kansas, and welcome to another Ag Talk with Doc show. And today I'm joined by another Kansas legend, the former senator from the great state of Kansas, Senator Pat Roberts. It is so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. It's good to be here. You're doing a great job uh, with this. Uh, it gets uh, good people on your show, and you get the information out to folks back home, and that's, that's what it's all about. Thank you. You're welcome. K-State is Agriculture, NBAP, the National bio -Agri defense Facility. Right. And this was actually, I, I remember decades ago, you talking about this vision, and I think it's going to open very soon. So many people think that this just happens overnight. I think it was the late 1990s, probably, that you were on Intel Committee. You take a trip to Russia. Is there, are you allowed to kind of share what maybe you saw, saw there and what this vision of what NBAP was going to look like? Well, I don't think there's anything classified about it. This was under the Nun Luger program. I was chairman of the Emerging Threats Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee. We were the authorizer of, of the Nunn Luger program. That was an effort by Senator Luger from Indiana, Senator Nunn from Georgia, two very highly respected people on foreign relations. And they decided why not get over to Russia, offer what help we could, especially to the secret cities that they had. They had about 12 or 13 of them where they were conducting all sorts of rather terrible things, to say the least. Uh, the one I went to was uh, a place called Obolinsk. I'm not going to try to spell it. I'll, uh, <laughs> a lot of vowels. And it's about 60 miles north, a little bit east of uh, Moscow. Frankie was with me. And at that particular time, it was post-Gorbachev. It was during that period where we had an opportunity to really be of help uh, to the Soviets, to, to, uh, to the Russians. And so we went to Obolinsk, and uh, my job w was to check on the... Uh, sort of a LBJ make work jobs that we gave them to keep the scientists there. We didn't want them to go somewhere else and we certainly didn't want any terrorist group to come in and take over this facility. They were doing research on pathogens to attack a country's food supply. Think about that. Talk about an evil empire as President Reagan uh, described them. Um, so Frank and I w visited tremendous amounts of pathogens in almost like a, um, a row after row after row of uh, a warehouse containing uh, hoof and mouth disease uh, and you just keep going with all the things that would hurt agriculture, avian flu, uh, the things we have to guard against and that uh, K-State does such a great job. I was stunned uh, by this uh, just before the lunch that they had for Frankie and myself as a visitor. Uh, and prior to that, we had met with all of these folks that we were trying to keep in that area and provide jobs for them. Uh, it was sort of like an LBJ work program. And uh, so there I am, and so here are all these people complaining about the assistance they're getting because it didn't really match up with what they thought they wanted to do. Sound familiar it like on a town hall meeting, you know. <laughs> and uh, I I'm thinking, what on earth am I doing here? And so. The first thing we did was to increase security because they didn't have any and we didn't want any terrorist group coming in there. And so the next thing we did, they opened up a big vault and there was Ebola, there was a smallpox, uh, uh, you know, kind of a infestation where there was nothing you could do about it. It was far, far worse than smallpox as we know it, on and on and on and on. And then they closed the door and I remember the scientist then saying, let's have lunch. So I told Frankie, uh, look, I know you drink, <clears throat> you don't drink this, you don't drink vodka, but they'll serve vodka. I'm suggesting we both had vo vodka and gargle with it. Uh, that just, just a suggestion because of seeing all this in this vault. Uh, we did increase the security. We did try to fine-tune those programs. But I, case, uh, I, I came back to K-State and John Weefald at the time, jumping John Weefald, great president and uh, really put K-State on the map along with Bill Snyder and everybody else at that particular time. Had a great faculty. And um, so I, he said, where you been? And I told him. I said, what we need in this country is a national agriculture bio facility to offset the danger of our country being attacked 
uh, with regards to our food supply. Very easy to do. And he immediately said, K-State can do that. So long story short, um, they put an admiral in charge of the bidding process. The admiral I had protected from some of the more eager Beaver Democrats on the Intelligence Committee, because I was the chairman of intelligence at that particular time. The admiral testified, and Senator Levin, who was a great senator, but he, he had a, he's sort of like a Wolverine, he was from Michigan, and uh, gee whiz, he was beating up on this guy who, you know, that just isn't right. You don't take flag officers or generals and you know, beat up on them with their record of achievement for America. So I tapped the gavel and I said, ah, come on, Senator, we don't have to be doing that. Let's behave ourselves and ask a decent question. Uh, so at any rate, um, I sort of saved him from that. Well, guess who is the guy in charge of the bidding? The same admiral. So we had sort of an in, and then they indicated they would throw in the BRI, i.e. Pat Roberts Hall, and uh, in the process. Finally came down to Texas, who else, and uh, K-State, Kansas. State legislature, Governor Sebelius, uh, a whole bunch of folks at, from Manhattan, uh, all came together. We stayed out of session, or pardon me, we stayed in session. Texas upped the bid and then adjourned. We were still in. We upped their bid and one in regards to that whole contract to have out there what we call NBAC. I think it's 2023 uh, that we may open it, although maybe, um, I don't think it'll be earlier. And I think uh, our new president, President Linton, who's doing a great job, by the way, and he's invited uh, our Ag Secretary, Tom Belsack, who I know very well, and uh, they'll have to chain me for me not to be there. So it was a long, long ordeal um, simply to get the money to keep it going. Uh, I think we must have had five different exercises, uh, one where I served as president and we underwent an attack of uh, hoof and mouth disease. And as it turned out, we lost our entire livestock industry. All of our exports stopped. This type of war games. Yes, deal. and uh, we had several of our real cabinet members there it was a Republican administration. Ann Vanderman was Secretary of Ag. And, uh, but you had to follow the script. And the script said that well, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. What do you do? And something like that would happen, started in Texas. By the time Oklahoma found out about it and said, we are not accepting any more shipments of, uh, or you know, trucking, or whatever, whatever, from uh, Texas to Oklahoma, it was clear up to North Dakota. Then you have the problem of how you exterminate all of these cows. And then you have, <laughs> it was just one problem right after the other. And as I indicated, all of our exports stopped, so it was just a mess. So I'm very glad that finally we are opening this facility. We're already doing some work there. Uh, they have about six things that they're studying all, already, and at the BRI we're studying about 37 of them. And bringing new businesses to Manhattan. So I think, again, the vision you shared with me 10, 15, 20 years ago is coming to fruition. Let's switch and talk about USAID uh, a little bit. Um, we talk about purpose in life and our farmers back home, certainly they want to make a living. They enjoy our, our lifestyle. But USAID allows Kansans to project uh, across the world. And there's a national security component to this as well, foreign diplomacy. Can you describe through your years what USAID has meant? And didn't it start in Kansas, the, the kind of the concept? Um, I have mixed emotions about AID. Okay. Uh, I would compare it more to a Peace Corps uh, effort, but with development assistance, um, all sorts of things that you just go down the list that a country is having problems and you're trying to stabilize the country, you're trying to be of help to them. So AID has a mission. So is the World Food Program. And there was an effort back in the day by a Republican administration uh, to have the World Food Program 
swallowed up by AID. Hmm. And they had a, a group of people that met and they came up with a recommendation and it was going to be by executive order and I found out about it. Now this is the McGovern Dole program if you're from Massachusetts or wherever McGovern, uh, pardon Most me, the Dakotas. Dakotas. Yes. How could I forget that? Uh, so I talked with the individual concerned, not going to give you out the name or anything, but I knew him. And I said, you've done this without any hearings. The, the Ag Committee hasn't been uh, informed. The Finance Committee hasn't been informed. And you're just doing this. Uh, to tell the secret, my daughter was based in Rome with the World Food Program at that time. She let us know that this was going to happen. Uh, she was our 007. And so to try to stop that and maintain the integrity of the World Food Program, which is different than that of the AID program. Uh, finally, this individual said, oh, well, I'll tell you what, Senator, in sort of a way that I didn't appreciate, why don't you send me a letter? I said, I'll do that. So I went down to the floor. Every Democrat I talked to, I said, my God, AID is trying to swallow up the McGovern Dole program, the feeding program. Would you sign this letter? And uh, Bob Bird signed it right away. And then we had our leader sign it right away. And, but when I talked to a Republican, it was the Dole McGovern program. Absolutely. And so we got all 100 senators. Wow. And I sent that in at the bottom, and then I, I'm not you know, going to tell you the name. There's no use of doing that. But I called him by the first name, and I said, Dear so-and-so, you asked for a letter. Here it is. I think you can see the intent of the Senate. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before or since. And so we separated AID from the World uh, Food Program. Right now, David Beasley, the former governor of South Carolina, is the head of the World Food Program. Boy, is he doing a great job, especially with what's going on in the Ukraine. And I hope that we can maintain that integrity. And I hope that they keep him, even though he is a Republican. I'm trying to weigh in with the, for the powers that be with the administration. Uh, which is like knocking on a door and there's nobody in, uh, for me at least, and uh, which I find quite, quite perplexing. And uh, that's not the way we ought to be operating. But you know, you know what is taking place. AID has a special mission. Uh, at the time that we went over on a Codell, and I'm trying to think which one or who headed that one up, but we were looking at AID, and we were looking into I Indonesia and then some of those. Polynesian, you know, islands, uh, and uh, they were trying to convince them to go to solar panels and windmills, and they were using small, you know, typical uh, uh, things that they had been using, and they wanted more of them. They weren't too excited about that, uh, but that was an effort clear back in the day, and uh, so I'm for AID. I think they do a great job. Uh, it's not a Peace Corps, it's, just, it's much more, I'm not going to say valuable, but it's much more targeted than that, and it does give, it is, uh, you've indicated agriculture, Kansas, and for that matter, any other state like that, an opportunity to serve. So they do a good job, but they just keep their cotton-picking hands off of the World Food Program. There you go. Uh, but let's talk about the farm economy of the 1980s for a moment. So I'm uh, oh, in dear. college, about uh, working on our family farms, uh, my grandfather is very mad at Jimmy Carter. He's put an embargo on wheat to, to Russia. We have inflation uh, happening. We have interest rates 18%, and land values are going down. And sometimes history repeats itself. My farmers back home, as, as you know, are scared about interest rates. Sure. What, what, would, what were the lessons we learned from them, and is there any advice you'd pass on to my farmers today? Uh, I think the best thing to do is sit on the wagon tongue and listen to them, express your concern, your understanding of the problem, listen to them. Uh, they usually come up with pretty good ideas back in that t uh, particular time. We had a guy named Arnold Paulson who went around and charged about $10,000 for uh, farmers, which they didn't have. Uh, and he had something called NORM, the National Organization of Raw Materials. And he would give this lecture and said, a country's true wealth is not based on paper or either gold or silver. It is the raw materials which we produce, i.e. what farmers produce. 
Well, you let a farmer sit in the combine and listen to that for about five minutes, and he's going to say, boy, that guy really knows what he's talking about. Thus came the idea of parody. And so that's when the farmers would go on strike, <laughs> which is not a good idea, and uh, said, we want full parody. Uh, back based on a 1918 formula. Wheat would have been $22 a bushel. And so there were a lot of demonstrations that really started out in eastern Colorado. Uh, they didn't have a congressman like Keith Sebelius, who I worked for at that time. And um, this was a little prior to 1980, but it's very similar to the situation that we're talking about. We had 1,300 farmers uh, in our office. That's hard to do in the Longworth building. And so consequently, they lined up and down. And so we just moved our operation to the annex. And Keith said, you're the guy. You're the foreman. You're the, you know, you're the guy that's, you know, head them up and let's redistribute these people. I went down every, well, I'll just be honest about it, every liberal organization I could think of. Say, and I would say, okay, now you 15 go visit these folks. They don't really understand agriculture and talk about the value of full parity. Well, talking with Bob Dole's office and big Bill Taggart at the time, uh, who headed up agriculture, we came up with a plan called flexible parity. And we finally convinced the leadership, at least let's have a vote on it. It went down by over 100 votes, which uh, absolutely crushed the uh, idea that these farm the dream that these farmers had that they would finally get uh, what they thought they were owed to all this was connected during a very tough time uh, I think that was probably more in the 70s and that I came to the Congress in 1980 then we had a repeat and these things happen when you have disruptions in the market and you can see that today uh, without any question uh, the, the situation with Russia and the Ukraine that's an area, uh, a lot of farmers came to Kansas from the Ukraine area, mm -hmm. and uh, especially around Hayes, and introduced hard red winter wheat, uh, you know, years back. Right now, um, we have to persevere. Uh, the thing that is of concern to me is that uh, with a focus on green energy, crop insurance is in danger again. Um, as the so-called father of crop insurance along with Bob Carey of Nebraska. Uh, leave it as it is. It's an insurance program. Farmers depend on it. It's the number one issue in farm country. And, but we have, we have too much of the same regulations we got rid of under the previous president that are coming back. WOTUS, um, endangered species, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, farmers, are really going through a tough time with their cost inputs, even if they can get what they want with fertilizer or seed or parts or everything else. In the meantime, you have historic prices at the, uh, uh, at the elevator there in Dodge. I think it's about nine bucks today. It was about 12 bucks here, some back. I've never seen prices like that. So you may get a lot of income, but dealing with all these regulations and then dealing with all these shortages and all these supply chain products and all the cost inputs, uh, our farmers are going through a very difficult time. And thank you for being on the Ag Committee and thank you for persevering. It's good news we have Tracy Mann out there on the House and now even Sharice Davids uh, on, the, on the House Ag Committee. It's a great team. The all-powerful Ag Committee. Oh, the sometimes powerful Ag Committee. Let's finish up on that, Senator Roberts. Uh, many people do call you the father of crop insurance. And I think what folks, when they're going to buy groceries in this country, they take it for granted they, that they're this, the, um, there'll be plenty of quantity of everything. And though inflation is certainly riddling the grocery stores, things like crop insurance have helped keep the prices down a little bit. We have another farm bill. I think you've only been through seven or eight of these. You've co-authored. Yeah, yeah, eight of them. You've co-authored half of those. What's your parting advice for Tracy Mann and myself and Sharice as we go, on, we, we tackle a, a farm bill? Well, number one, hang tough. Number two, uh, the theme for last, or last year, here I am, uh, 218. That was the last farm bill. And our theme was consistency and predictability. It was needed then, it's 
beyond reason that you can't figure that out now. And that's true with almost anybody in business or any manufacturing uh, uh, component, uh, especially true for farmers, ranchers, growers, and everybody connected with agriculture. We do it once again want to get into the big farmer, little farmer business. Once again, now we're trying to tie it to the Green New Deal in terms of what farming practices are you practicing? Are we sure that you are doing things in terms of conservation that are green? We're already doing that. Absolutely. Show me a farmer that, it does, that does not practice good conservation practices and I will show you a broke farmer. Yes. And so everybody knows that uh, through extension, uh, through all sorts of our land grant universities and just the very nature of farming. It's, I, I mean, we, we get it. To put in regulations on saying, are we sure there, I mean, who the heck is going to be doing inspecting that? Uh, by the way, they're, well, they're changing the committees that really make recommendations to the farmers county by county by county now, and that's on a sort of a woke kind of basis. Uh, too many regs, too much of that, and uh, we need to keep cr uh, crop insurance. It's working now. It is a contract with that individual farmer. It's like your housing insurance, it's like your life insurance, it's like your car insurance. Uh, should mention car insurance, they'll put some green requirements on that for sure. But it's insurance and it's a contract and it's working. So why mess it up? Why mess it up? So just keep it as it is. It prevents uh, any administration when we get into bad weather and boy, Mother Nature, I don't know what we've done to her, but she's really, you know, we have the hurricane coming and we Droughts. have drought out in Kansas and we have just, you know, keep on going, wildfires. You always then have a disaster program. A disaster program is a disaster uh, to pass. It's a disaster to implement. Uh, you saw the situation with our previous president where he threw around tariffs like lightning bolts and then you had the retaliation. Then we had to come up with a, quote, disaster program to help the producers. Seventy billion dollars later, trying to allocate that out to different commodities. And wouldn't, they would say, well, corn got too much. Obviously, cotton always gets too much. Cotton is king. Yeah. Bow your head. And uh, at any rate, uh, the disaster programs are really a disaster unless you really have a disaster. Obviously, then that comes in, into place. So to substitute a disaster on top of some crazy regulated crop insurance program where you're only giving it to small farmers, which is ridiculous. All right. Well, Senator Pat Roberts, thank you for joining me for, with another episode of Ag Talk with Doc and Ema. Thank you so much. Ema, thank you. Have yes, me sir. back. Yes, I will. Thanks, you everybody. Bet.